Hello everyone, my name is Bobby Yogatama, and in this talk, I will present my work on enabling multi-GPU support in GEM5. This is the work that I'm doing with Professor Matthew Sinclair and Professor Michael Swift from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So in recent few years, multi-GPU has started to become more and more popular, and there are mainly two reasons that drives people to start using multiple GPU. The first one is so that we can fit in larger working set into the GPU, and the second one is so that we can, of course, speed up the execution time of our workload. In fact, some of the previous experiments have shown that training GoogleNet could be three times faster when using four GPUs. As to how do we use multiple GPUs, there is also various ways of doing that. For example, first we can do uh, workload partitioning. So in this case, if we have a workload that consists of multiple kernels, what we can do here is that we can partition the workload into several sets of kernels that will be executed on different GPUs. Or instead of partitioning the workload, we can also partition the data instead. So in this case, we will partition the input data so that each GPUs will be working on different sets of input data. And because of all these benefits, industry has also adopted multi-GPU system. For example, Facebook in 2017 introducing Big Basin, which is its machine learning platform that uses eight GPUs. However, despite of all the trends in multi-GPU, unfortunately, um, current GPU simulator such as GEM5 and GPGPU Sim only capable of simulating a single GPU, which makes it difficult if we want to study issue arising in multi-GPU system such as scheduling and resource allocation issue. And this is why in this work we will extend multi-GPU support in GEM5. Now, since not all of you are familiar with how GEM5 uh, simulates GPU, we will start with a little bit overview of GEM5 AMD APU, which we built our work based on. So GEM5 AMD APU extends GEM5 with a GPU timing model that's executed on top of Rockcom, which is a framework for GPU accelerated computing. And if you want to hear more about GEM5 AMD APU, you can listen to a separate talk by AMD Research also in the GEM5 workshop. So if we take a look at the whole stack, starting from the application source to the hardware itself, we can sort of divide the whole stack into uh, three different space, the application and compilers, the user space, and the GEM5 space that is being simulated in GEM5. And the simulation flow will start from the application source that is being compiled by the SCC compiler, which is the, which is the GCC version for HIP which is the GPU programming language that will be used by the application. And the SCC compiler will then generate an application binary that will be loaded into the memory in GEM5. And at the same time, the SCC compiler will also produce an HCC libraries that will be used by the application source to invoke the ROCK R runtime library, which we'll call the user space driver or the ROCK T. This driver will then make an IOCTAL system call to the emulated driver or the ROCK K that is being simulated in GEM5 that will interact directly with the hardware. Now, fortunately for us, the user space itself already capable of supporting multiple GPU, so we only need to update the support in GEM5. And in this talk, I will explain where GEM5 lacks multi-GPU support and what do we do to extend this support. So we'll make three major changes to GEM5. And the first one is pretty much obvious. We will uh, replicate the GPU components because now we would want to simulate multiple GPUs. And the second one is we have to make some changes to the emulated driver or the rock K because all this time the rock K always assume a single GPU. So we have to make sure that the rock K will be able to support multiple GPU as well. And uh, the third changes that we'll make is the changes towards the coherence protocol. So we realized that the released APU model in GEM5 uh, uses write through for L1 and L2 CAS. However, according to the design documents that AMD release, GPU L2 CAS are typically write back instead. And thus, uh, we decide to enable the write back support for the GPU L2 CAS in GEM5 so that it could better model what the real GPU does and because it could also reduce pressure on the directory and main memory. So the support will be added on top of the multi GPU support that I mentioned in the previous slides. So the first changes that I mentioned before is to replicate the GPU components. So the GPU components that we replicate here is highlighted in the red box. So the model that we are using here is a single driver, multiple GPU model. So there will be only a single 
emulated driver will not be replicating the ROM, okay? But we will replicate the whole GPU node instead. So now each GPU will have its own common processor, hardware scheduler, packet processor, dispatcher, sets of compute units, and its own cache hierarchies that will sit on top of the same directory and the same memory. And we'll also have to make sure that when we replicate all of these components, we assign them with different GPU ID to make it distinguishable between one another. And for some of the components, like the packet processors, we also have to assign them with different address range that doesn't overlap with each other. And the code snippet here on the right-hand side show how um, do I uh, replicate the GPU components in the configuration file in GEM5. And the next changes that we'll have to make is to the emulated driver so that it could support multiple GPUs. So applications and GPU usually communicate through a software queues. And for example, here we have two applications running on two GPUs. So application A will send all of its works to GPU 1 and application B will send its work to both GPU. And therefore here, there will be one software queues for application A and two software queues for application B, one for each GPU. And inside this queue will be maintained the kernels of that applications. For example, here application A uh, has five kernels and all of them will be sent to GPU 1. So there will be five entries in the of software queues of application A. And the one who will create the queue and uh, send these kernels to GPU is the emulated driver itself. So in this case, the user space software will make an IOPTAL system call with the request of creating the queue to the emulated driver or the ROC key. The ROC key will then create the queue and then it will get the GPU ID information. So the GPU ID information here can be obtained from one of the arguments that is being passed to the IOCTEL. And it will be able to send the kernels or the works uh, to the GPU as specified by the GPU ID. And now, after we create the queue and assign the kernels, when we want to further manage the queue in the future, Gem5 has to know which GPU it's communicating with because it has to manage the simulated state for the GPU serving the queue. For example, take an example of when there is uh, another IOCTEL system call, but now with the request of destroying the queue. But now, the GPU ID information is not going to be passed as one of the arguments of the IOCTEL, but the simulated ROC K will still have to know which GPU it's communicating with because it will have to delete the shared state in the GPU that points to the queue. So, uh, in order to do this, what we need to do is we have to maintain the mapping between the software queues and the GPUs. In order to do that, we use a hash table as the data structure to maintain this mapping, and we'll add this has table to the emulated driver or the rock key. And the second changes that we'll make to the emulated driver is to the mmap system call. So uh, we called mmap when we are mapping the GPU doorbell to the memory. So doorbell here, uh, doorbell is a mechanism for software to notify or signal the hardware, or in this case, the hardware is the GPU, that there is some works to be done. And the software does this usually by writing to a memory locations that we called a doorbell region. And after the software writes to the doorbell region, the hardware or the GPU will then realize that there is some work to be done and then it will start to perform its task appropriately. However now, since we have multiple GPUs, what will happen here is that there will be multiple doorbell region, one for each GPU. And the problem with MMAP is MMAP doesn't have GPU ID information, so that when it's mapping the doorbell to the doorbell region, it doesn't know whether it should map it to the doorbell region of GPU 1, GPU 2, GPU 3, and so on. Uh, and the solution here is to encode the GPU ID information to the offset parameter that is being passed to a map. And this offset was earlier returned to the user space from the IOCTAL system call when we are creating the queue in the previous slides. And that's also when we encode the GPU ID information. And so that now we have uh, the GPU ID information imbued in the offset, we can then decode it to get the GPU ID, and then we can get the appropriate starting address for that particular doorbell region so that we can do the MMAP appropriately. And the last changes that we'll make here is to add a write-back support to the cache coherence protocol in GEM5. So uh, fortunately for us, 
the right back is already partially supported in jump 5 so that we don't have to add any new states to the state machine. However, the problem with the right back support that AMD provided right now is that jam 5 does nothing with the flush instruction at the end of the kernel so that now the data in the L2 does not get written back to the directory and the memory where it should be visible to other cores at the end of the kernel. And furthermore, we'll also have to ensure that we simulate the timing of the flush properly as well as the bandwidth pressure of the flush. And this problem previously doesn't exist with the write through cache since with write through what will happen is that when we are writing the data, the data will just uh, propagate through all of the cache hierarchies and therefore the data should be immediately visible to the directory and to the other core as well. So at the end of the kernels, we don't have to do anything uh, during the flash instruction. But for write back, that's, that's not the case because with write back here, what will happen is that when we are writing the data, the L2 will just hold the updated data. And in this situation, the directory and the other cores will not be able to see or access the updated data. And therefore, the solution that we employ here is that at the end of the kernels, when there is a flush instruction coming in from the cores to the L1, uh, we will pass the flush instruction as a flush event from the L1 to the L2, and then the L2 will then check all of its entries that is holding an updated or written data, and it will just flush all of those entries. And by flushing here, uh, the L2 will write back all of those entries to the directory to ensure that at the end of every kernels, the directory and the other cores should be able to see the updated data. And now, after we add all of those changes, um, we will run some uh, experiment to verify whether our multi-GPU support is working. So this is our test methodology, and this is the GPU configuration that we use, and this is the sets of benchmark that uh, we are running. So we choose this benchmark because this benchmark is small, but it could represent larger and more complex benchmark. So this is the graph of our GPU execution time for various benchmark running with various number of GPU. So in the Y axis here is the normalized execution time, normalized to one GPU. And we can sort of see that the execution time decrease as we increase the total number of GPU, which is pretty much expected. And another thing that we can see here is that the speed up is not linear. So uh, that means that when we are running with four GPUs, it doesn't mean that the execution time will drop to 25%. And the other thing that we can see here is that the speed up between workload varies. And this is because there is a serial portion of the program. And of course, the serial portions between one workload with, uh, and another could be different. And now that we have support for running multi-GPU experiment in Gem5, it opens up a wide variety of interesting research problems. The first one could be multi-GPU scheduling problems. So in this case, if you have uh, multiple applications running on multiple GPU, then the question is that how do you best schedule the kernels inside of these applications so that you could get the optimal performance. Or the second problem could be a data partitioning problem. So in this case, if you have a set of input data to be processed by multiple GPUs, then the question here is that how do you best partition the input data so that each of these GPUs could get uh, the best performance possible. So those are the two examples of future works that could be enabled by the support. So in conclusions, multi-GPU application has become increasingly common nowadays, but the issue here is that uh, Gem5 only supports a single GPU simulations, which makes it difficult if we want to study issue arising in multi-GPU system. And that's why we are adding multi-GPU support to Gem5. We replicate the GPU components, we modify the emulated driver, and we also enable Redback support in the CAS coherence protocol in Gem5. So we run a set of uh, benchmarks to verify our changes and it can be seen that the GPU execution time decreases as we increase the total number of GPU. So multi-GPU support is on its way and we believe that this extension will make it easier for others to perform multi-GPU simulations for their research. Right now we are still developing these extensions and we hope that it could be released sometime later this year. So thank you all for your attentions. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me during the live Q&A on the 3rd of June, or please don't hesitate me to drop me an email as well. Thank you.